Hello from the Starkville Civil War Arsenal. I'm Duffy Neubauer and today's video is called Shooting a Sweet Gum Mortar Part 2. Now if you haven't seen Part 1 I would advise that you maybe go back and look at Shooting a Sweet Gum Mortar Part 1 and in Part 1 we covered the ammunition, the fuse, we covered the construction of the mortar and we fired a few rounds. In Sweet Gum Mortar Part 2, we are going to cover a little bit more on how the weapon itself was serviced, explain how each individual cannoneer, what his job was, and then we're going to talk about a siege operation. And a siege operation is different from a battle. A battle, two armies met on the battlefield for a day or two and then they separated. In a siege, it's a long, continuous operation. Uh, sometimes it lasted many, many, many days, sometimes into the weeks. And after we get done showing you how the siege operation goes, and when you're talking siege, you're talking continuous shooting, so that means you shot at day and night. And we're going to attempt to show you how to shoot at a target at night when you can't see it. Now, the siege of Vicksburg, many people think, and I agree also, that it was probably the most famous of the sieges of the American Civil War. It lasted 47 days, and when it was over, General Ulysses S. Grant thought so much of these little mortars that were involved in the siege of Vicksburg, actually the last two days ended with the use of these two mortars. And General Grant in his memoirs said, and I would like to read to you from his memoirs right now, there were no mortars with the besiegers, except what the Navy had in front of the city. But wooden ones were made by taking logs of the toughest wood that could be found, boring them out for six or 12 pounder shells, and binding them with strong iron bands. These answered as cohorns, and the shells were successfully thrown from them into the trenches of the enemy. Now that we've established that these mortars were used at Vicksburg, and I would like to explain why they were used. Uh, General Grant came to Vicksburg and he made two frontal assaults on the city, which failed both times. When he surrounded the city, he said in his own words, I'm gonna simply out camp the enemy. And after waiting a week or so, and he knew that they weren't going to surrender, he came up with a third idea, and that was to dig trenches up to the earthworks dig a mine underneath the main earthwork, fill it with powder, and then blow it up. But there was one problem that occurred. As the besiegers were digging these trenches up to the earthworks, the Confederates started taking shells, lighting them by hand, and simply throwing them out of the earthworks down on top of the Union soldiers. Grant decided at this time he needed some small cohorn mortars, and cohorn mortars are mortars that are light enough to be moved or transported by the men. Uh, Grant had contacted the War Department. He had contacted Washington and said, we need mortars by June 20th. He had already been con in contact with uh, the War Department. After several attempts, no mortars ever came. There was never any contact with Grant. And then one of the engineers at Vicksburg, his name was Stuart R. Treslin, came to Grant and said, I can solve your problem. I will make mortars. So he made mortars. And after the mine explosion on July 1st, I'd like to read to you what uh, Stuart R. Treslin's words were about the use of the mortars in Vicksburg. July 1, the second mine was exploded. Previous to this time, I had constructed three wooden mortars, one six-pounder and two 12-pounders, and put them in position about 100 yards from the main redoubt. Immediately after the explosion, I commenced shelling the crater, dropping nearly every shell into its proper place. This fire I kept up at intervals for 48 hours, varying the direction from the small redan on the left to the main redoubt with telling effect. The enemy's engineer in charge of the works, Captain Kelly, assured me 21 men were killed and 72 wounded by these shells. 
During these 48 hours, I fired 102 of the six pounder and 366 of the 12 pounder shells into the earthworks. All right, now that you know a little bit of the background of the mortars and how they were used at Vicksburg, now we'd like to show you more specifically what each member of the Sweet Gum Battery did. So we're going to go ahead and load and fire and we're going to explain specifically what each number did. And just as a reference point, if you see a target downrange, it is approximately 100 yards. Just like Stuart Treslin said, they fired at Vicksburg. So at this time, I would like to call my battery into position. Sweet gum battery, fall in. Number off. One, two, three. To your posts. Load with five second fuse. At this point, the gunner is waiting for the ammunition to be brought towards the muzzle. He will bring me the powder charge and the projectile, which has already been fused. When a number two man uh, approaches the gunner, the gunner will reach in, get the powder. All right, at this time, I have dumped the powder into the chamber. And during a normal siege operation, if you had siege mortars, you would have a a wad which the projectile could sit on and at this time we're going to place the round on our grommet and I'd like to say one thing kind of a little bit of a tip in the official records at Spanish Fort they talk about taking turpentine and covering this ball in turpentine now we all know that turpentine is extremely flammable and what they were trying to do is increase the possibility or the chance of that fuse lighting. There's also another very uh, common technique and that was to take very fine powder. Uh, they would go over and get it from uh, pistol ammunition and they would take the very fine powder and just sprinkle some all the way around the fuse to ensure that it ignited. And when you put the ball in the barrel, you want to make sure that the fuse is pointing directly up because there's more flame going to come over the top to ignite uh, that fuse. Ready. Fire. Sometimes it was necessary with the mortar, as you have carbon build up in there, they would use a scraper. It was a metal tool, looked like a chisel on one end and a spoon on the other. But because this is a wooden bore, we don't want to scrape too hard. So they made improvised scrapers and all they were doing is trying to knock the carbon down. There's a carbon build up. And you probably noticed that before I did my scraping, the number one man went up into the vent and he pushed all the debris that might be in the vent into the chamber. Now he'll come in with a wiper and wipe the bore down. This is probably the safest weapon to shoot because I can see directly into the bore in the chamber. Earlier in the video, I talked about shooting at night. Uh, Treslin shot his 468 rounds into the Confederate earthworks and that came out to about one round every six and a half minutes for a continuous 48 hours and that is what normal siege rate is. Normal fire in siege rate is four an hour. They can speed that up a little bit but with the three mortars they're dumping about 12 rounds an hour into the fort. Now when you shoot at night Obviously in a siege operation, that's a big target. It is a city, it is a earthworks fort or possibly a masonry fort. So you've got a pretty big target, but you can't see it. They may make a mistake and leave some lights on, a campfire, I doubt it, or a lantern, but we're gonna assume right now that it's total darkness. So all we do to get ready for night firing is simply aim the mortar just like we did during the day and that's what we're going to do right now. Muzzle right, 
Good. We've just determined our line, but what we're going to do now is we don't want to try and retard the recoil at all, but I do want to put a reference and notice that I'm putting this in front of the tenons. I don't want it back because there might be some recoil. But now we have reference sticks that we can reference the tube. The elevation is fixed at 65 degrees, so we don't have to worry about elevation. And if this was a gun that was on wheels, what they would do, usually siege artillery was on a wooden platform, and they would take those stakes and nail them as a cleat right alongside the wheel. And then what they would do for elevation is as they're shooting during the day, they would cut a stake or a stick, put that underneath the breech, work the elevating gear, and it was like a gold gauge. It would just slide in there just that it would slide in there. So then during the night, they had their elevation set with the stick, and their references with the cleats on the sides of the wheel. All we have to do is reference our two sides and we'll be able to shoot at night. All right, right now it is, we do have a little bit of light left, but I wanted to show you when we still had light what we're going to do to uh, cut fuses, uh, measure out powder. We do have to do it with candles and obviously you have to be extremely careful, but any light source that is around the magazine, even close, needs to be sheltered in glass. And that's why this type of a lantern is used. It has a coating or, or a cover uh, to stop any heat source getting close to the powder. There's another type of lantern that was quite often used, and it's called a dark lantern. Every battery wagon had six of these dark lanterns. A lot of the engineers had dark lanterns, and it's used when you are working at night, but you don't want to be seen. And how it works is very, very simple. It is Japan black, uh, which is like a lacquer. It's hard to see a black lantern at night. And then uh, all the holes that are punched in here diffuse what light comes out, and it's also the oxygen source. But when I turn the lantern back towards myself, I can get some light. So I am going to put the dark side of the lantern toward the enemy. And as we talked about earlier, that flag is, is roughly 100 yards, the same distance that uh, Treslin was shooting at Vicksburg. And uh, we don't want to be seen when we're down here working with these mortars, so we're going to use some dark lanterns tonight when we come back.
right, that's the end of the siege. We have fired all day well into the night and they have surrendered down at the fort, which ends the siege. We are going to cease firing and I'll go home. I hope you enjoyed the video. It's a little bit unusual firing at night, but it is unique. And I hope that if you do enjoy the video that you will share it with a friend. It will be titled Shooting a Sweet Gum Mortar Part 2. And I hope sometime you have the opportunity to take a look at my website, StarkvilleCivilWarArsenal.com. Thank you, and I hope to see you again sometime at another video. Good night.